You'd be forgiven for thinking that this was my IBM PC from 1981, which I've shown on the channel before. But this is actually a completely different personal computer released by IBM in March of 1983. And the only reason that I've come by one 38 and a half years later is it was very cheap and not working. Apart from the full height IBM hard drive in this thing, yeah I bet that works, you'd have trouble from looking at the front to figure out what this machine even is. It's not until you get around the back of the thing and you can see the badge, IBM 5160, that you realise that this is an IBM XT. Now you've got to be wondering at this point, why did he buy this machine if it doesn't work? And why on earth is he making a video on it? Well first of all, did you notice the impressive physical condition that this machine is in? There's scarcely a scratch on it, and you never know, that IBM hard drive might actually work. That'd be worth more than I paid for the entire machine. Hello and welcome back to PC Retro Tech. Today's video begins with a repair. I actually purchased this machine a while back and at the time I made a little video about me trying to fix it. I wasn't going to show it on the channel, but then I realised that it's part of the history of this machine and of the channel itself. So I'm going to start with that today and it begins with me trying to diagnose various faults. But listen out for the point where my voice changes as I suddenly get very excited about this machine. So let's pick up the video at the start where I'm trying to figure out why it does nothing when I switch it on. And of course I'm looking for the most common fault, a blown capacitor. Well I've managed to get the main board out and I've gone over all of the tantalum capacitors and basically there's one here that seems to register as a short according to my multimeter. Uh, in fact it's only 8.9 ohms which seems a little low. What I'm going to do is take this one out and just see whether the short goes away if the power supply starts up and if that's the case then we'll just replace this capacitor. It's a slightly annoying case because the pins here are actually bent over so it's going to make it just that little bit more difficult to get out. With a couple of touches of the soldering iron I did manage to actually get it out and so let's just plug it into the power supply now and see whether the fault has gone away and if so we'll replace this capacitor. I just have it sitting on an insulating sheet here just so nothing will short out and I have the power supply plugged in uh, so let's power it on and see whether that fault is gone and yeah that's no problem at all it's starting up just fine so that was probably the main problem with the main board well it's not an exact match for color but i only have two lead tantalums that are new and this is a three lead one you can use two lead ones they're the wrong color as well so uh, i may as well just go with a three lead one uh, at least the component matches otherwise i've just put my least expensive cga card in there and uh, hopefully it doesn't blow up well, let's switch it on with a monitor and a keyboard attached. Ah, we're getting beep tones and that sounds like video, probably because I've got the switch on the main board set incorrectly. So I'll set it up for CGA. All right, well, I switched the switch and let's see if this makes any difference. And it looks like something's happening. Yeah, so we have a mostly working computer, it seems. So time to focus on the hard drive, I think. Well I plugged the hard drive card in but look what happens when I try to turn it on. Absolutely nothing. Uh, so there seems to be a short on that hard drive card as well. Uh, so time to get out the multimeter again. Well I actually had a little bit of trouble finding the tantalum with the multimeter and so I decided to put it back in the machine again uh, just to see whether it was actually working after all and actually for a few seconds it seemed to be okay. Uh, then there was a loud spark and a bang and well this is the component that showed itself. Well once again not a perfect match for colour but uh, certainly the right part so let's try this out and see whether we finally have a working hard drive card. Well this time I'll turn it on on camera which should prevent anything interesting happening. Uh, no pops and smoke and the CGA card is working just fine getting a picture on the monitor so yeah it looks like that may be the only problem with the hard drive card so let's plug it into the hard drive. Well I've plugged all the cables into the hard drive and I guess there's only one thing to do and that is to turn it on and see what happens. Uh, it'd be nice if there was some kind of sound like it was turning and guess what? 
it's spinning up. Oh my goodness. It doesn't sound to be in good condition, so I'm gonna switch it off. Well, I've taken the board out of the hard drive and very often what happens with these drives is that the main bearing loses uh, lubrication. So what I'm gonna do is just put some lubrication in there and if we're in luck, uh, then maybe this drive will actually work. Now I'm just gonna run the drive upside down briefly and see whether that oil will go down into the motor. And I'm hearing something, but it does sound like it's scraping the heads, which is not a good sound. Uh, let's see whether it initializes or not. Yeah, that's definitely not sounding like a good sound there. Uh, sounds like something's scraping. Yeah, I'd say this is definitely a dead drive. So far I haven't seen any... Did that just flash? I think it's flashing. It's reading something. Oh my goodness. Oh my. Oh my goodness. It's booting off the drive. I cannot believe it. It's noisy and it definitely doesn't sound healthy, but uh, it's actually working. It's hard to believe with all that noise that that is actually a working drive. So I'll sit here and watch this. I've got it upside down just so that the oil can seep into the bearing. And uh, if you let them heat up, uh, then sometimes uh, they really come good and they start to sound a lot better as everything just sort of uh, thins out in there. Uh, you do have to sit and watch them very intently though, uh, because what can happen is the transistors can actually overheat and uh, then you get smoke coming out of it. It doesn't mean that it's died. Uh, you can have smoke for example, just because of dust or grease on the actual transistor and it's just working too hard to keep the drive running at full revs. Uh, but that's what I'm going to do here and hopefully uh, we can nurse this thing back to life. Well, nothing's died, so time to switch it on with the floppy drive connected. Uh, well, let's see if the floppy drive card has a short on it, uh, just like all the other cards. And it doesn't seem to. Uh, well, it's counted all the RAM and the floppy drive seems to make appropriate noises. So there's some chance that that's actually working. So let's actually put a disc in and see whether it will boot from a floppy disk. So there's a light and a beep and it is actually making noises like it's booting. Uh, it's a bit hard to tell though uh, whether it's still going. The drive is making so much racket, the hard drive. And I uh, know it's actually working starting MS-DOS. Look at that. And yeah, uh, hopefully it keeps going. It's a very slow drive, I have to say. Uh, it's really not breaking any speed records. I can't really tell if it's just... Oh, no, it's worked. It's actually working. Well, I'm able to run ScanDisk. I have actually had some other issues with the machine. So every now and again, it refuses to boot. And I guess that the reason for this is because the rails on the supply are too low. I noticed that uh, the 12 volt rail is only 11 volts. Well, take a look at that. Not a single bad sector found. And it went through very quickly as well, which is not characteristic at all of these old drives. So I think this drive is actually in good condition. And I had to think about the noise, and I'm beginning to think that the brushes might actually be scraping as they go past the commutator. So this could be something that's actually repairable. If Future I... me here again. Let's leave the repair video there. That guy will babble on for hours if you let him. And I realized since making that video that I can actually fix my power supply issue by switching with the one in my PC. Whoever set that machine up actually used the wrong supply and they put an XT power supply in it. So let's take this one out and then we'll switch it over with the one in the other machine. You might be able to see that the supply in my PC is 130 watts, and that's almost twice what it should be. So I'm going to take it out of here and put it where it belongs in the XT. Well, now the moment of truth, let's see if this actually fits in the XT. And it looks like it's actually made for it. What a surprise. Well, after all that effort, let's switch it on and see if it works. What? Oh, not again. 
What's gone wrong with it this time? Well, these are familiar symptoms. Switch it on, the fan judders, but nothing else happens. Uh, the only thing plugged in is the main board, and I'm pretty sure that this is gonna be another one of those tantalum capacitors. Well, it seems that the short is across the 12 volt rail, and when I check this capacitor here, this C56, uh, well, that seems pretty suspicious, and it's the only one on the board that I can find that seems to be shorted, so I'm gonna go ahead and replace that. Let's hope we get it to work this time. Well, the capacitor is replaced. Let's switch it on and see whether it works now. And thank goodness for that. All right, so let's plug it all in and see if we can get it to go. This time for sure, let's switch it on again and hopefully this time we actually get a working machine. Crossing my fingers, it looks like it's working. Thank goodness for that. Another card that came with the machine, which I haven't talked about, is this Yamaha V6363 video card. And I don't know much about it, except that the chipset is capable of MDA, CJ, and Hercules. But I believe this is a Hercules card, so it won't work on my monitor. It's just a curiosity to put aside for another day. But let's get back to the XT, and I want to discuss what the differences are between this and the PC. I just wanted to check the size of the drive here. And yeah, very small. I'm pretty sure this is one of the original 10 megabyte IBM hard drives. Uh, you can see there's a little bit of software on here already. For example, there's DBase, which is a database program, and Harvard Graphics, which is a very early presentation program. Uh, it's extremely primitive though. And this really is one of the advantages of the XT over the PC. You could put a hard drive in it and load your software onto the drive. Of course, you'd fill it up pretty quickly with only 10 megabytes. Another big improvement over the PC is the number of expansion slots. I've got a CJ graphics card in here. I have a serial port for a mouse. I've got an MFM controller for the hard drive. And then I've got a floppy drive controller as well and still have plenty of slots left. There's a total of eight here instead of five. And it might not seem like much these days, but the minimum configuration for the PC was 16 or later 64 kilobytes. And this one has a minimum of 128. And actually I have 640K installed on board. And this means I don't have to worry about an extra card for memory. Now you might be asking, didn't IBM update the processor and increase the clock speed? And later they did, there was a 286 XT. But initially, it was the same specifications as the original IBM PC, an 8088 CPU at 4.77 MHz. But there was also another significant improvement they made. It was IBM PC-DOS version 2. The big advantage here is that it offered a 9 sector per track floppy format instead of the original 8, and this increased the capacity of double-sided floppy disks from 320 kilobytes to 360K. Anyway, you didn't come to see your grandma's knitting, so let's take a look at some games. And all the ones that I selected are from 1983, uh, the same year that the XT came out. And I've picked ones that are either three-dimensional or particularly colorful or extremely well illustrated. Uh, most games of the era were not. They were either text-based or they were very simple 2D affairs like Pac-Man or Space Invaders. Uh, breakout clients and so on. Uh, so this one, Battlezone, is obviously 3D and it's really quite playable. Uh, basically I didn't need to think about which keys to press and uh, it really is relatively smooth. I mean obviously there's not an extremely high frame rate but you couldn't expect that uh, with the 8088 at 4.77 megahertz. Uh, but it is otherwise extremely well done and uh, quite enjoyable to play. So this is my first selection of games from 1983, and the amazing thing about this one is the entire game is just 67 kilobytes on disk, uh, which is really quite amazing. So let's move on to the second game, and that is Jay Bird. I apologize for the annoying soundtrack. There's no volume on the XT, of course, and you can't skip past this little bit. But I picked this game because it's innovative for the era. They're doing something that's a little different to everybody else. Uh, although I have to say, it's not particularly intellectually challenging. What you have to do is jump around and fill in the squares uh, on the pyramid here just by jumping on them. And of course, if you hit one of the eggs or the snakes, then you die. 
And that's really all there is to it. Admittedly, I've got this on novice level at the moment, and perhaps it's a little bit more interesting if you play it on a harder level. But uh, I really think this is mainly aimed at small children rather than uh, adults like we are now. Um, yeah, I guess uh, there's limited entertainment to be had here. And as you can see on the next level, you just get more of the same. So on to the next game. The next game that I chose is Moonbugs, and it's a pretty challenging game because it's very fast moving. You'll find yourself starting off by firing a lot and not hitting anything, uh, but then your brain will kind of adapt and you'll start to hit the Moonbugs. And the objective is to stop them getting to the bottom of the screen where they'll pick up the little canisters uh, which have been carted over to your factory on the left. And it's a very colourful game, 16 colours, uh, much more colourful than the usual four colour games of the era. And I guess they're using a hacked up text mode for that. Also pretty good sound effects. Uh, the playability is great, although it took me ages to find the fire button. It's actually the F1 key, and I only found it because I went looking for a help screen uh, to try and figure it out. Uh, so yeah, definitely worth a play if you haven't seen it before. Once you get through to the end of the first level, uh, it upgrades you to uranium status and refuels you, and then you get a bonus score. The next game I chose is Bushidor, The Way of the Warrior, and it's four color CGA, but an impressive achievement for 1983, as you'll see. It's in the genre of fighting games, and look at those impressive illustrations. Uh, that's to say nothing of the incredible animation of the characters here. Uh, this is amazing if you compare this to the average game of 1983, this is just head and shoulders above. Now, I'm actually pretty crap at playing this. I found it was a bit of a learning curve, so you're actually watching the demo at the moment. Obviously the objective of the game is to show off your fighting skills and avoid the guys with weapons. I'm not exactly sure why we don't have a weapon. I guess that's something to do with the particular martial art. There's a lot of different play areas in the game, which makes it really cool to play. And I could imagine kids absolutely loving this back in the day. So 100% uh, recommend this one if you've not seen it before. The next game I chose is Schultz's Treasure. I'm not going to be able to show exactly what this is like to play, because unfortunately it's not working the way it's supposed to. Uh, but you can at least see that the idea is uh, you move about a maze. Uh, I've selected the keyboard option, but unfortunately there's only one key I can find on the keyboard that does anything at all, and it really just seems to change the direction of travel. And so uh, there's really not much else I can show you. Uh, the idea, of course, is to deal with all of these animals that come to get you in the maze. And I can see why these maze games were so difficult to play back in the day. Uh, it really seems that the mazes were absolutely huge. Anyway, that's Schultz's treasure. The final thing I thought I would show is the composite output of my CGA card. It's a little bit muddy here because it has to go through a converter from NTSC to the PAL format that we use here in Europe. I'm just using a Commodore 1084S monitor. Now this is Bumblebug. It's an educational title by IBM themselves written in BASIC and it does have some very colorful pictures in it. It's nothing to play, it's for young children to teach them arithmetic. Here's another one of the loading screens, which is very colourful of course, but then the gameplay itself is very bland and boring looking. Another game that supports the composite output is Jay Bird, which is one of the reasons I picked it earlier. But I don't think it really adds very much to the game to be able to play it in composite colour. Uh, you tell me, is this better or is it pretty much just the same thing with slightly different colours? I don't know whether I'll continue using this machine on a regular basis. I absolutely love the machine, but having a working full height original 10 megabyte IBM hard drive is just an unobtainable thing these days. If you try to purchase one of those online in working condition, you're either going to be very disappointed or out one hell of a lot of money. And this one hasn't missed a beat. And likewise, the rest of this machine is in such stunning physical condition that I really want to preserve it now for the future. So although I might bring it out occasionally to maintain it, and you may see it on the channel every now and again, I don't think it's going to be something that I'm going to use every other day. 
Speaking of the channel, uh, obviously if you enjoyed this video, you might consider subscribing. I have a lot of cool content coming up. And I do appreciate your likes and especially your comments below. Uh, if you want to be notified when I upload, there's a little bell you can click for that. And uh, that's all I have time for this week. Thanks very much for watching and we'll see you in a later video. Bye.